Uh, today we are very pleased uh, to have our visitor, uh, Dr. Benjamin Lindner uh, from Rutgers University. Uh, Dr. Lindner uh, got his PhD from Berkeley at the Ines School and worked there as a postdoc uh, for a few years with John Chan. Um, for, uh, and then after that, he went to UCLA as a postdoc uh, to work with uh, David Nailing and uh, as, as uh, a postdoc in uh, science uh, and, and research scientist. And then uh, he moved to Rutgers um, in 2009 and uh, is now assistant professor in Rutgers. So um, he has done a lot of interesting work and published a lot of interesting paper. So uh, we want to welcome him uh, to uh, give his talk today. Uh, the, I don't stop myself, this is convergence zone, variability and biases in models. All right, well, thanks. Can, can you hear me? So thanks for the, the nice introduction. Uh, yeah, it turns out Rutgers isn't that far away from Stony Brook, but we're driving across New York City. Uh, yeah, that's quite a barrier. Rutgers. Uh, anyway. So what I'm going to talk about today is some work that we've been doing by, by we, uh, largely at this point, my PhD student, Matt Nisnik, uh, and PhD student of David Nealon at UCLA, Mary Langenbrunner. Uh, work that we've been doing to understand a particular feature of interest in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, quite far away from here, um, although maybe you could get there quicker than I got up here. South Pacific Convergence Zone, and we want to look at some issues in the variability of this feature and biases uh, in the simulation thereof in models. So just to, to kind of give you an overview, I've, I've kind of broken out three topics here for discussion. Uh, given time constraints, I probably won't get to this one, but hopefully we'll cover the first two. So we're going to look at some work we've been doing, kind of ongoing work, uh, in terms of what we call principal uncertainty patterns as a methodology for understanding uh, the spectrum of behavior across current generation climate models. And then the work that my student Matt has been doing, looking more at the processes involved in the synoptic interactions of wind moisture and precipitation along the South Pacific Convergence Zone. And just to kind of orient you to the geography of the South Pacific, uh, here's Australia, over here South America. The SPCZ is this, this kind of diagonally oriented zone of convection that extends all the way from the Western Pacific Whirlpool in the deep tropics, uh, as you can see, uh, quite far into the Central Pacific and to about 30 degrees south. So it's, it's a rather impressively large feature. Uh, surprisingly, or I think surprisingly few, people are studying it, mainly because it's in the southern hemisphere, so there's relatively fewer people to study it. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting feature for reasons that I'll hope to show you. So just to kind of, you know, Put the perspective here. You know, why why should we care about it? Uh, this is an example of flooding that happened in the island of Fiji. Fiji, uh, kind of this group of islands here, uh, experienced significant flooding. 2012 was a rather bad year in Fiji, both in January and this photograph in April. There were tremendous rains that caused lots of flooding, uh, lots of destruction of agriculture and loss of human life. So this flooding episode, while ultimately it was caused by, you know, in this case, I think a tropical depression, uh, is related in some sense to this bigger feature, the SPCZ, uh, because it, it's a significant control of the climate and the variability in the region. So just a bit more about the background, you know, really why I'm interested in studying it Despite how big it is, how extensive it is, there's some very fundamental questions about the SPCZ, how it forms, 
why it's oriented the way that it is. It has this sort of unique diagonal orientation. Uh, so a, a kind of motivating question here is how is the SPCZ maintained and what factors lead to this kind of distinct spatial structure? A nice paper by Ken Takahashi and David Battisti in 2007 kind of summarized the state of understanding of the SPCZ at the time. And they kind of distinguish two broad paradigms for, uh, for classes of mechanisms to explain the SPCZ. One of them they term Western control. And this basically posits that the SPCZ develops in response, kind of remote response to convective heating over the Western Pacific warm pool. So the Western Pacific warm pool has the warmest sea surface temperatures on Earth. It's characterized by very intense deep convection. Uh, and so this kind of view of the SPCZ is that it's developing in response to that convection. The alternative, or the, the sort of other set of mechanisms, they term Eastern control. And this is basically, you know, as you might expect, if this one is Western control, it's more about what's happening to the west of the SPCZ. This is more about what's happening to the east of the SPCZ. Um, so over the southeastern tropical Pacific, once you get above the boundary layer, it's one of the driest environments on Earth. And so in this set of mechanisms, it's mainly about the interaction between uh, the, the dry descent region in the southeastern Pacific and the SPCZ. A number of studies, including some work that kind of sets up what I'm talking about here, we kind of evaluated some of these uh, mechanisms. So there's kind of the the sort of process, uh, the, the uncertainty or the, the uh, lack of understanding of the processes that control the SPCZ, and then also in terms of model simulation, um, if you know anything about simulation of the tropical Pacific, it's characterized by many well-known biases, including the so-called double ITCZ, so tendency for models to simulate two intertropical convergence zones in the eastern Pacific, uh, there should only be one, and biases in the sea surface temperature field in the east, in the so-called Eastern Pacific cold tone. Maybe less well known or less well appreciated are biases that occur within the SPCZ itself. Uh, oftentimes in models, we tend to see SPCZs that are too zonally oriented. They might have deep convection that penetrates much too far into the, the dry southeastern Pacific. And just to give you, give you kind of a sense of that, this is a figure uh, Kind of comparing uh, some of the models from this coupled model intercomparison project phase five, basically the, the state of the art models used in the, the IPCC report. Basically, what each of the line contours is showing is the four millimeter per day uh, ISO line or ISO Hyatt, I guess, of precipitation. And this is, you can think of this as kind of a proxy, you know. Differentiating regions, at least in the tropics, of very intense convection from less intense convection. And then the blue shading here uh, represents the, the area enclosed by the four millimeter per day contour from an observational data set, the CMAP product. So basically, where you see light blue shading in the tropics, that's where we tend to see these zones or spatially extensive regions of strong convection. And so if the models were perfectly agreeing on the distribution of those convection zones, you know, they would, they would basically outline the blue shaded region. So one can look at a figure like this and probably point to any place on the map and say, oh, there's something here we don't understand. Um, I would argue in places like the South Pacific Convergence Zone, it might be especially problematic. So you see here the tendency, the, the models are not bringing the, the strong convection far enough to the south, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. A number of these contours you can see extending a bit too far uh, into this white area, which is relatively dry. So, you know, why do we care about this? Well, if you ask climate modelers, they care about it because they want their models to be right. Uh, but also, if you think about what we're using these, what are we ultimately using these tools for? You want to maybe understand what's going to happen to the future climate particularly in response to anthropogenic or human-induced climate change. And the fact that we have these biases or these, these uh, 
these improperly simulated features in current climate means you know it's kind of hard to project accurately if we don't understand this baseline. So oftentimes when you and this is true not just of the SPCZ, but anytime you look at model output from something like CMIP-5, you have 20 or 30 models uh, that have gone into this. And you can plot a postage stamp plot of model output like this. And you know, it's kind of hard to synthesize all of that information. And so that's really the, the first topic that I'll be talking about today is, is an approach we've been taking to try to synthesize uh, the information that we see here. Can we pull out systematic ways in which the models are looking like one another or differing from one another? So it's it's kind of a data analysis. At, at some level, it's a data analysis problem. But then hopefully, we can also interpret some of those systematic differences or similarities in terms of some underlying mechanisms. One kind of process that I'm interested in, uh, as some, something of an aside, although it's relevant to what I'll talk about, is if you look at model simulations, in this case, we're showing the multi, uh, the model ensemble mean, the MEM, of all 20 or 30 CMIP 5 models that we looked at. And we're just computing the intensity of rainfall over this region, kind of a box average and comparing it to the intensity of rainfall over this region. So this is the ITCZ in the Eastern Pacific. And here you see this tendency. Uh, this is the so-called double ITCZ problem. So the models are trying to simulate deep convection, strong rainfall here, where you don't really see it in observations. <coughs> so one question that we might ask is, you know, if there are biases in the simulation here, how do they affect what's happening over so how are these things coupled? So a simple thing we can do is just compare the intensity of rainfall simulated by the models here to here. So that's a scatter plot over here. Basically, what I'm showing here by the symbols are the, the mean DJF values of rainfall within each of these boxes. So there's, there's quite a bit of scatter. Uh, but there is maybe some tendency, when you look at the climatologies of the models, uh, that when they have more intense rainfall in the SPCZ, they have less, uh, or when they have uh, more intense rainfall, the SPCZ on this axis, they have less intense rainfall in the ITCZ. And when they're simulating more intense rainfall in the ITCZ, they tend to have weaker SPCZs. And also, plotted on here, the, the, the lines are kind of the fits through individual model uh, data or model output, where we just look at monthly correspondence between rainfall here and here. And so you see within the models themselves that there are some mechanisms that relate SPCZ precipitation to ITCZ precipitation. So when one is more intense, the other tends to be less intense. So in some sense, we might think about the climatology problem, the fact that there could be biases in the, the rainfall that couples these two regions. And maybe there's something, maybe by comparing to the way the models behave uh, sort of internally, we might be able to understand something about what's causing those biases. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah. So what's this is, we must have some hypothesis or or some basic concept about why you you you, you analyze these two boxes. So so what was the hypothesis? Well, so here we were well, I'm really just setting this up at this point as kind of a motivation. Um, there there are some reasons to expect, you know, that if if we intense, if we make, if the rainfall in the model is more intense here because of the, the sort of dynamical and thermodynamic response to that intense rainfall, it might kill off some of the rainfall here. So, so I have a question. Also. Yeah. So I would expect that this, uh, the relationship between these two uh, locations that you picked should be very sensitive to the state of ENSO. That, that's correct. And in fact, that's, you know, if you, that, that's kind of the interpretation, I think, of these lines uh, over here, that when you, when you have an El Nino event, it tends to shift the SPCZ precipitation closer to the equator. And so that might, in a sense, reduce the rainfall here while it increases over here. Okay, good. So the methodology that I want to 
uh, share with you today is what we call principal uncertainty pattern or Huff analysis. The background here, apart from what I've already discussed, is we have a number of prior studies, people like Joe Brown at CSIRO in Australia, have done a lot of work to analyze different metrics of SPCZ uh, behavior, intensity of rainfall within the SPCZ, uh, sort of location, longitude, latitude, mean axis of rainfall, you know, the kind of orientation of the diagonal of the SPCZ. So there's been a lot of work that's kind of looked at this in terms of distinct metrics. I would argue, you know, that a challenge not only in our understanding of something like the SPCZ, but anytime we're looking at comparing models and looking for biases, that we want to be able to characterize the spatially diverse, the potentially diverse expression of simulated behavior in a more systematic or objective and maybe more holistic fashion than what you might be able to do if you just look at a box average or a mean longitude or something. So we're, we're trying to develop a more uh, systematic approach for doing this. Biases themselves are commonly evaluated in terms of the behavior of the model ensemble mean. Uh, so if you take the whole suite of model output, average them together, get one nap, compare that to the observations. But it's also useful to understand how models might be differing from this, this kind of mean model behavior. And that's really what this methodology is designed to do. Precipitation, I think, is one of the interesting things, but I think challenging things about understanding precipitation is we might want to know something about the intensity, so how much rain is falling, uh, when and where it's raining, but that those rain bands or those areas of convection can move around. And so we might want to distinguish differences that come about through changing the intensity of rainfall uh, from those that result from just spatially rearranging where the rainfall is occurring. So the PUP approach involves applying statistical data reduction techniques such as empirical orthogonal functions to the entire suite of model output. That is, we, you know, we set up the EOF, which is basically, you know, uh, diagonalizing matrix. <coughs> we do that approach simultaneously on, you know, all the maps of, say, model climatology at the same so usually when you think about doing an EOF, you have a field that's a function of space and time. The EOF calculates the time and space components of the variability. Here we're, we're kind of replacing the time axis by an axis of model, you know, model uh, number. And the spatial part is the maps of rainfall. So this approach is similar to some recent work. There's a study by uh, Lee and Jay et al. Or, uh, and uh, they call this intermodel DOS, basically the same idea. The analysis details, I can't go through the, the full uh, set of details, but basically I'm going to show you 30 years of DJF, December, January, Feb February, climato climatological precipitation output from uh, the historic CMIP-5 run, so those are basically models that are run as coupled coupled ocean atmosphere models with the prescribed uh, greenhouse gas forcing, volcanoes, et cetera. And then the so-called AMIP style simulations that at least some of the modeling groups from uh, CMIP performed in which SST or sea surface temperature is prescribed as a boundary condition uh, to the model. So these are basically the atmospheric only simulations given the prescribed sea surface temperature. And by comparing these, the fully coupled models to the atmosphere only models, we might understand something about biases. So when we throw these, you know, for the historic simulations, we have 36 maps. We take those 36 maps, construct a, a large matrix out of those 36 maps, and then subject it to EOF analysis. So you get uh, modes or patterns of variability that come out of those, uh, that decomposition of that big matrix. And so the first mode, the leading uh, mode of the decomposition, uh, the spatial pattern is shown here. 
this mode explains about 25%, 24% of the total field variance. So basically, it accounts for 25% of the scatter uh, across the model ensemble. And what a, a few other features that are shown on here. So blue corresponds to <coughs> You know, models with, or, or blue corresponds to positive values. This scale is in millimeters per day. Reds and yellows correspond to negative, relatively, uh, or negative values. The four millimeter per day contour, uh, sort of the mean over all of the models is shown by the, the, the thin black line. And some measure just the linear regress, regression fit through the slope or through the the uh, most intense rainfall kind of to define the slope of the SPCZ is shown by the black dotted line and the light dotted line is the, the mean slope or mean axis from the, the I think the GPCP uh, output. So you see here the tendency for the, the models, you know, it's maybe not very clear from where you're sitting, but the slope of the SPCZ is simulated by the models isn't quite as steep as the slope simulated or the slope obtained from the observations. So this spatial map or EOF is characterized by this kind of horseshoe shaped uh, region of positive values along the northern periphery of the, uh, it's actually reversed, positive values along the southern periphery of the ITCZ and along the northern periphery of the SPCZ. And then on either side of that, on the northern edge of the ITCZ and the southern edge of the SPCZ, uh, you see the opposite uh, sign. And so this reflects kind of the spread in how wide uh, this sort of complex region of convection consisting of both the SPCZ and the ITCZ, distinguishing models that have wider complexes or more spread out in the meridional direction from models that have more contracted or or uh, equatorward situated convection zones. Within the SPCZ itself, since that's really the, the principal target that I'm interested in, the largest value, positive values here are occurring slightly equatorward of this mean SPCZ axis. Just a question. Yeah. So, so what resolution do you interpolate the data? Oh, sorry, yeah, that's the yeah. detail I should have, should have uh, alluded to. These models, of course, are run on their own native grids, but we regridded all of the models to two and a half by two and a half degrees. And that's the same resolution that we're looking at the GPCP output. That, that's actually an interesting question. I mean, you know, in some sense, you might ask if you have models that are of different resolution, are they simulating different SPCZs? And to some extent, that's, that's probably true. Uh, the bottom panel here shows the, the principal component basically the other part of the, the, the mode that corresponds to how much this pattern loads onto individual models, okay? So it has both positive and negative values. That means, if you look, it's kind of hard to make out the model names here, that's kind of intentional uh, so that no one thinks that we're picking on them because we're <laughs> focusing on what their model is or is, or is not doing correctly. But these models over here have the strongest positive loading. So that means they look, the, those models look most like this pattern. The models over here have the strongest negative loading, so you have to multiply this by a minus sign. So these models over here have more positive, or they, they tend to have rainfall that's concentrated closer to the equator, whereas the models over here have rainfall that's flipped around, so less concentrated close to the equator and more off equatorial. This PC loading, if you, again, are able to make out the individual model names, you'll notice that there is some clustering of the ensemble members according to their parent models. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, we have 36 models that go into this decomposition, but if you look at the names of those models, and, you know, here I'll just read off two, not picking on them. There's an Earth system model from MPI, the Max Planck Institute, another Earth system model from MPI, but those are at two different resolutions, okay? But those two models are, are clustered together. So that kind of makes sense, right? If the models have the same parent, 
they just differ in terms of resolution or maybe there's some physics parameterization that's slightly different. But otherwise, those models might be expected to behave in a similar way. So that's a general tendency that we, we kind of see that clustering, which again is not too surprising. The second EOF mode or principal uncertainty pattern explains about 17% of the variance. In the sort of parlance of EOFs, of course, we can have, you know, the way we did the data reduction here, we have 36 modes. You might expect that not all of those modes are meaningful. And there are mechanisms, there are approaches to evaluate the significance of, of the modes. We used a simple approach here proposed by North et al., which is kind of the standard. Uh, which is, which basically tells us that this second mode is separated or uh, distinct from the higher order modes, although it's not as well separated from the first mode as you might like. So basically what that tells us is the methodology might not be cleanly separating the mode that you see here from the leading mode. This EOF shows large positive values <coughs> along the SPCZ axis, particularly in the subtropical portions of, you know, down around 15 or 20 south in the SPCZ. And you also see uh, negative, the largest negative values here occurring in the Eastern Pacific, some along the, the southern periphery of the ITCZ, but also this other band, which is basically the spurious southern hemisphere ITCZ, the models are tending to Um, let's see. So again, looking at the, the, the uh, principal components tells us which models look most like this pattern, or which, which of the models this pattern loads onto and by how much. So here the behaviors may be a little bit different. There are two models uh, that kind of stick out on the positive side. So, and those particular models when you look at the actual climatological map of rainfall, it makes sense that they tend to uh, produce a very strong feature here and not so much up here. Um, so maybe in some sense, this second mode is picking up more of, it's maybe not as systematic a difference across the, the models, but it's maybe focusing on two or three models that are kind of behaving in a more pathological So, so far I've been talking about the results of the coupled models, but now we can turn to the, the AMEP simulations or the atmosphere only simulations. The reason for doing this is here we've, we've controlled for sea surface temperature. You know, you might expect that if the models simulate sea surface temperature incorrectly, the rainfall might in turn be simulated incorrectly. So here we're saying if we give the models the correct sea surface temperature distribution, any the, the differences that we see across the ensemble of models are just due to processes on the, the sort of atmospheric side of things. And so the, we only get one mode uh, out of this decomposition that's significant. It explains about the same amount of variance as the leading mode from the coupled decomposition. And you can see here that this mode is characterized by kind of a trimodal structure, positive values in the kind of core of the SPCZ negative values to either side of the ITCZ and over northern Australia. And also that the biggest signatures here are in the Western Pacific as opposed to over here where you don't see too much. Now in terms of, you know, trying to interpret, you know, one question that you should always ask whenever you see a data reduction approach like this is, is it meaningful? Does it make sense in a physical way or is it just a mathematical artifact of the, the data reduction? And I would point out you know, the, the sort of trade-off here between the positive values here and the negative values over Australia, that we have done some work, we, we meaning me and some other folks, have looked at, you know, how variations in the strength of the, the summer monsoon that develops over Australia, remember this is DJF, so that's summer in the southern hemisphere, and basically find that there is this connection that with more intense monsoon precipitation over Australia, we tend to see a reduction in precipitation uh, over the SPCZ. So at I, least. I have another question. Yep. 
So uh, in these figures of principal components, we see in all three figures you have shown, we see many models where the loading is close to zero. Right. So what does that mean that they don't have useful information about SPC? Well, what it means in, in the sense here, remember with, with the EOF analysis, there could still be a bias <coughs> in the mean behavior across the models. It's only saying that this, this kind of pattern of bias in, that it doesn't appear in the models that are close to zero. So, it's, uh, I, so uh, anyway, the, the figure on top is, is not the bias, it is the variability among the models. Right. 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 So we're, yeah, I, this is kind of, if you like, a bias from the multi-model mean. It's not a bias from, you know, we usually think about the bias as the deviation of the model from the observations, or yeah. the mean of the models from the observations. Yeah. So here we're thinking about it more in terms of this, maybe right. bias is a bad word, it's yeah. the spread in the ensemble of models, relative so, to whatever so, their so mean the, is. So then the, the models with uh, close to zero loading, so they are the best describers of the mean condition? Well, I, I, would, the least bias? I wouldn't say that, because the models here that have low loading in this mode might have high loading, loading in another mode. So it's only with respect to this particular mode that the models that you see here basically have zero. Yeah, so but in, in any particular uh, case, when you are interpreting this, wouldn't it be like you will uh, enhance the signal if you separate those models which have <coughs> to zero, close to zero loading? Right, I mean, that would be an approach. You could take, if, if you took the models out here and the models out here took their difference, you'd get a large signal that would look like this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. This just gives us a, I mean, in some sense, we're just giving all of this information from the models to the data reduction yeah. technique, and it's telling us how the models separate out. Actually, I, I have a question yeah. about the climatology. So, yes. so it seems to me, just by looking at that, that the because the black line is the right. technology there. So, is it correct to to uh, say that when you are given the sea surface temperature? The model actually does a better job That's, in yeah, simulating the, the USPCC as well as less tendency for the double IPCC. Right. Thanks for pointing that uh, out. Uh, that that is true. When you know, I, I should have put the, the two over top of one another. So maybe if I toggle back, you see here the more zonal orientation of the four millimeter per day contour from the mean across all models. Here it's a bit more diagonal. Uh, and in fact, you know, the black line here is the mean uh, slope of the SPCZ from this set of models. And that pretty much lies over top of the observation. So giving, giving the models information about the sea surface temperature distribution does seem to correct the geometry, if you will. It gives you this, this better con spatial configuration. You still get, in terms of the differences across the models, you can still see large differences in the amplitude of the rainfall that they're simulating, but they get a better kind of spatial structure. So does the total variance actually decrease or that's, similar to that of experiment? That's an interesting question. The, the, the total variance doesn't actually decrease all that much. I mean, that was kind of surprising to me. Uh, but part of it is the you know, only showing the four millimeter per day is a little bit misleading. You've got twice that much rainfall or more over here. So that really, you know, kind of uh, biases the, the variance to the regions of high rainfall. But if, yeah, if you were just doing a, a kind of measure based on the location of the four millimeter per day line, you would see that it's much improved. So, uh, let's see. So if we take this decomposition from the atmosphere only models, and we look at how it relates to what I showed for the coupled models, uh, this leading mode actually cor correlates, if you do a spatial pattern correlation, correlates 0.63, so very significantly with the leading mode of the coupled model decomposition, but is also correlating to some extent, and this 0.22 is still significant even though it's small. It still correlates with the second mode, so that this, the the biases in the in in the 
models that appear just from the atmosphere, and the process that we're thinking of here mainly is convection. Convection is parameterized in these models and is, is therefore subject to uncertainty. That that affects that that's kind of leading into both the first and second modes from the coupled analysis. So I mentioned and someone brought up earlier about ENSO and the the, the sort of relationship that you might expect based on sea surface temperature and precipitation. And so we can do, you know, th this approach, we can generalize it. So we can take, instead of EOFs of the uh, precipitation itself, we can do sort of a joint analysis of precipitation and say sea surface temperature. So we can ask, you know, if, if we look at the coupled uh, fields of precipitation and sea surface temperature across the, the spread in that coupling across these models, uh, what do we see? So this is the, the leading mode of this so-called joint uh, singular value decomposition. And there's a lot of information on this slide, so let me try to step you through it. So the precipitation is shown here uh, in the top left. So basically, it, it looks a lot like the first mode from the precipitation only analysis. You've got this horseshoe shaped pattern close to the equator, negative or opposite values on either side. And then the, the new piece of information here is the sea surface temperature. So this is the sea surface, the pattern of sea surface temperature spread uh, across the models uh, that basically is most strongly co varying with this precipitation field. So what you see here is. Uh, for thinking about a model here that has a positive loading with respect to this precipitation pattern, that those models, when they have this precipitation pattern, tend to have uh, warmer than sort of the mean model behavior uh, in the sea surface temperature field. So if you think about, you know, on interannual time scales, the El Nino Southern Oscillation is known to affect the SPCZ. During an El Nino event, sea surface temperature warms in the central and eastern Pacific, and you tend to see a shifting or a displacement of SPCZ convection toward the equator. And that's basically what we're seeing here in this kind of principal uncertainty pattern, that for models that are warmer than the mean behavior, they tend to have precipitation that's, you know, relative to this mean SPCZ axis, the precipitation is more intense on the equatorward side of that mean SPCZ axis. So this at least gives us a clue that the behavior that we see in terms of this precipitation pattern is linked to a large extent to the sea surface temperature field. <coughs> the approach can also be applied to other metrics of precipitation variability. So here we, we basically take the precipitation variance, the mean variance over December, January, February, we feed max of the, the variance into the decomposition, and we get out principal uncertainty patterns of the model spread and variance. We get two modes out of this analysis that are significant. The first mode here, and I, I don't have the principal component loadings, unfortunately, but uh, Basically, you see it's all blue uh, throughout the SPCZ, the ITCZ, and you know, kind of this region in the middle. So basically, the interpretation here is that this, this mode, and you'd see this if you look at the principal components, you have some models that are just more variable than other models. So the models that are more variable would have this be characterized by this pattern. The models that are less variable would have the opposite. So that, that's kind of well known, that the level of variance within the models varies across the ensemble of models. The second pattern uh, is an interesting one. So this is one where you, it distinguishes models that have more variance in the SPCZ and less variance along the central and eastern Pacific or along the equator. And this might be what you would expect based on models that have different levels of uh, variability in the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So models that tend to have, uh, so here it's sign negative, so if the El Nino events are less intense, they tend to have 
uh, convection in the SPCZ that's more intense. So that's kind of that that trade-off, if you will, that if convection strengthens over a period, it tends to weaken over here. So there's there's kind of you know I think one of the interesting applications of this approach, and it's still a work in progress, but is to think about these kind of relationships uh, between different features. So just to kind of summarize, uh, this part, this principal uncertainty pattern methodology highlights the intra-ensemble or the, the spread, uh, intra-ensemble disparity or spread in precipitation intensity and spatial configuration in the SPCZ. If we look at the historic, the so-called historic simulations or the coupled ocean atmosphere simulations apart from the, the AMIP or atmosphere only style simulations, we can distinguish some biases that appear to come just from atmospheric processes uh, from those that arise because of coupling uh, within the system. So you know, if coupled models don't simulate the sea surface temperature field correctly, we might not expect them to simulate precipitation correctly. We can also apply the, the principal uncertainty pattern approach to other fields, not just the climatologies of the model precipitation, but its variants. And one of the things we're kind of interested in pursuing with this is to understand how uh, biases that might appear in the variants uh, affect the biases or the model spread that we see in the mean, the sort of climatological mean. A study by Baird Langenbrunner uh, in preparation is applying this approach to look at projections of uh, warming induced precipitation change. So basically taking the PUP approach and applying it to the end of the century uh, rainfall differences. In terms of what we still like to do with this, uh, we can take the principal components, this kind of index of the model loadings on different uh, patterns, and we can attempt to relate those principal components to possible sources of bias. Uh, so one, you know, apart from the way models treat convection, we know that models have a lot of difficulty in simulating low-level cloud fraction, uh, basically the marine stratocumulus that should be present in the Southeast Pacific. The models oftentimes are not able to do that well. So we can sort of attempt to say whether these bias or these, these model spread patterns are related in some systematic way to uh, errors or problems in the way the models simulate low-level clouds. And of course, Ultimately, we can do this using this joint approach. So we can take as many fields as we want, throw them into the decomposition and get joint patterns. Uh, so there's still, I think, interesting angles to be pursued there. And again, looking at the, uh, the principal uncertainty patterns of the variance field, we can also look at the filtered variance. So one feature of interest that is known to impact the uh, SPCZ is the Madden-Julian oscillation, uh, an intraseasonal uh, band uh, oscillation, which isn't particularly well simulated by current generation models. So it might be instructive to look at different uh, band pass filtered variances and see how they, they correspond. So in the last couple of minutes, I won't have time to go through this in the detail I hoped, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about SPCZ variability and some work that we're doing to look at the SPCZ variability. So on long time scales, you know, I'm talking centennial, millennial time scales, we know that the SPCZ moves or is displaced in response to or in association with variations in sea surface temperatures in both the Western Pacific warm pool and the Eastern Pacific cold tongue. On interannual time scales, there's the well-known relationship between the SPCZ and El Nino. And actually, some interesting work by uh, Wen Zhu Kai and colleagues uh, has looked at some very pathological cases where uh, under the right conditions, so not just a function of El Nino intensity, but also the sort of spatial distribution of sea surface temperature anomalies, the SPCZ can collapse in a very nonlinear way uh, onto the ITCZ so that there's effectively just one region of convection along the equator. And of course, that's a very different state in the Pacific. And you know, the fact that there is this behavior uh, 
makes us a little bit concerned about what might happen in the future. Uh, are these kind of zonal collapse events going to become more common? And then on synoptic timescales, all the way through intraseasonal timescales, we see lots of variability in the SPCZ. Uh, on intraseasonal timescales, I mentioned the Madden Julian oscillation. The results that I don't have much time to talk about focus on synoptic timescales, so basically in the one to two week uh, timescale window. This synoptic variability is important in terms of the, the overall circulation, general circulation of the atmosphere. They're responsible in subtropical to mid latitudes for the poleward export of heat and moisture from the tropics to high latitudes. And in the southern hemisphere, they are associated with, uh, just like in, in kind of comparable regions in the northern hemisphere, we see the development of so called atmospheric river events, basically persistent plumes of moisture that develop along the SPCZ and you know, maybe impact the coast of Chile or uh, southern South America. This is just a figure highlighting the synoptic the kind of filtering of variability within this part of the SPCZ. So you see here, this is from observations, the MJO band appearing in this, this outer spectrum. We're kind of focusing on what's happening over here in synoptic timescales. And this is some work that we did a few years ago looking at the relationship. Here we were motivated by looking at what happens as the strength of low level winds, basically they're trade winds blowing from the Eastern Pacific into the SPCZ. We wanted to see what happens to the moisture and precipitation fields when we composited with respect to variations of the trade winds. Basically you get these kind of uh, maps, composite differences. So when the trade winds are weaker than normal, so normally the trade winds are blowing from east to west, so when they're weaker than normal or anomalous westerly, we tend to see an increase in moisture. Fortunately, I haven't drawn the mean SPCZ on here, but an increase in moisture along the, the kind of uh, northeastern edge of the subtropical SPCZ, and a decrease in moisture in this nice kind of cyclonic pattern of circulation at low levels. This is the precipitation field. It, it's, of course, a lot messier. But there's a tendency during relaxed or weakened trade winds to see an increase in convection to the east. And so what we're kind of motivated with, and I think this is the, the slide that I'll, I'll end on as kind of a question, although I'm happy to talk about the work that we're doing to try to elucidate this. We have a situation in which this is just looking at a zonal uh, or looking at a longitudinal transect through I think this is 15 south. So basically, as you move from the Western Pacific in kind of the heart of the SPCZ toward the Central and Eastern Pacific, uh, we're just kind of looking at what happens to different fields. So here's the moisture field, you know, high values of column integrated water vapor, basically the column of atmosphere is moist in the west, it's dry in the east. This is precipitation at the bottom. Uh, where it's moist in the west, you tend to see more intense precipitation. Where it's not as moist in the east, you see less precipitation. And kind of separated here uh, into two groups based on the strength of the trade winds. So when the trade winds are uh, weaker than normal, this is a negative scale. So when the trade winds are anomalous westerly, you see the column integrated water vapor tends to be higher, uh, kind of on this margin region. The precipitation is also higher. And so, you know, we have a situation in which relaxed trade winds are associated with increased moisture along the eastern edge of the SPCZ and kind of a displacement of the edge or the margin of the convection zone. And so, you know, you might ask a reasonable question here, what's driving what? So if it's somehow possible to induce a variation in the, the, the kind of external perturbation to the wind field, you might see the you might think of the moisture and precipitation responding to that perturbation, but it could be that you know something comes along that tickles the convection, that causes a change in both the precipitation and the moisture, which in turn feeds back onto the winds. And so the, the point I'll leave you with here is that the work that we're trying to do to understand this causal chain, uh, whether the arrows go you know from here to here or here to here. Uh, so I think. That'll probably end.
happy to talk about this if you have any questions. the ensemble mean if we only took one, you know, the problem with the CMIP-5 output is uh, some model groups provided multiple integrations, others provided one. So we only used one model from each, but we used 30 years of data or 30 years of output. So it's the average DJF climatology over 30 years. For, for the, in terms of the only one ensemble member? One ensemble member. That was, again, to be to be fair to the groups that only provided, or at the time we did the analysis, that only had one ensemble. And another question yep. is, um, is it possible to do the pulse analysis for, to see the interannual variation? Yeah, in fact, that that's something we would like to do. Uh, you know, and I have to admit here that Baird Langenbrunner, the student at UCLA, is the one who's actually doing the analysis. So I'm kind of rate limited by, or we're rate limited by how fast he's able to. Yeah, I mean, that one question that I, I mean, why I was sort of initially interested in this is, you know, oftentimes people compare the mean model behavior over all years, which includes both El Nino events and La Nina events. What I was initially interested in is saying, well, if we subdivide the models into La Nina phase and El Nino phase, is it possible that the bias that we see in the models is skewed? You know, I would, I would hypothesize it's probably skewed to the El Nino phase when you, the Eastern Pacific is much warmer and it probably exaggerates this double ITCZ bias. But yeah, that's something we would like to do. And you can also look at global warming, right? So if you look at the last 10 years versus, say, say from the 20s versus the 2000s versus the 1960s, you take a difference. Right. Do the same analysis, you could see how the model. Right. Is yeah. So the even longer time scale. Right. I mean, here it was, here the, the interest was more in kind of exploring the application of the methodology. But I think there's enough, you know, there's there's issues with it, but I think there's enough to kind of say, that, yeah, this might be an interesting way to try to analyze the model outcome. So I want to have you try to, since I think you basically shows that most analysis of country the first and second mode. Mm -hmm. So I want to have you actually make this what called the bike plot. No, I haven't. So, so you can see whether the model actually costs as much? Or it, they just yeah. spread them over the creation? In, in fact, yeah, that, again, I know you don't want to talk about your model, but it's yeah, but, be interesting. Right, and you know, that. so one of the things we were interested, one of the things I was interested in doing was, and it's kind of hard sometimes given the documentation of the models, but you know, we know models fall into different, they use different schemes for doing deep convection. Uh, so yeah, you, you can start to say, you know, do clusters of models that come out of this analysis map in some systematic way onto different yeah. yeah, that's going to be interesting. I mean, this may not be politically correct, but certainly interesting because you may even be able to see you know, if they do cluster, right? Right. And you yes. can see how, what the features actually are. Yes, yeah, so I'd probably hide the model. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask one more question, just yeah. to this picture. Yeah. Since we do know that uh, the trade winds become much stronger, say, in the last 10 years, so do you actually see these things in the decadal, like increased, this would be sort of decreased moisture? Yeah, that would be, that, that's not something I've looked at, but that would be something interesting to look at. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this isn't sort of time scale. Yeah, according to analysis. My question goes back to your early statements you made about the con what controls the vision 
and right. the objective of the of the summit was to to become six to the very difficult. And you have the 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 West right. Western uh, versus uh, Eastern. Uh, the East Coast. Right. With the people the experiment here in what you did, is it correct to say that especially with when you did it with the with the prescribed SSD right. <laughs> I wouldn't say that the East control, I, don't, I wouldn't say that that says it's rubbish. Um, what it would say is the model, the spread in the models is sensitive to uh, SSTs to the East of the SDCC. So, you know, in some sense, that might support the idea of Eastern control. If, if you change the SST there, the SPCC is going to respond to the SP, the change in SST. Well, I saw more of the West. The West was controlling most of what was happening. Right. I mean, so I didn't quite make the point, but this, the, you know, the SPCC, we, it's, it's a big feature. It extends all the way from the tropics to mid latitudes. So probably expect different things control different parts of it, even though it, it looks continuous. Uh, certainly the convection in the sort of western Pacific part of it is deep tropical convection. Once you get to high latitudes, you've got interactions with fronts. And that's part of the synoptic story that I didn't get to. You see interactions with mid-latitude westerlies in the southern hemisphere kind of come along and excite so there are different processes. So Keith, yeah. I just want to know about why did you choose, if you chose this word, why did you choose the word PUPS? Why not just use the word PPA analysis rather than coin a new acronym? So I think the idea behind principal uncertainty pattern, and I'm not throwing my colleague David us, but he was the one that suggested using that. <laughs> if you know David Nealon's work, he comes. He tends to come up with lots of cute names for things, like if you've heard of the rich gets richer mechanism or the uphanding mechanism. That's David. But uh, I think the idea. I mean, part of it is to kind of emphasize that it. You know, when you say EUFs or principal component analysis, you're, you're kind of thinking space and time. Uh, here it's space and model, you know, model, model, an index of model replaces time. So that, that's kind of part of it. But also to emphasize what it's trying to do. And, you know, I, some of the comments that were raised, I think, are good in terms of how I was referring to this. We're trying to characterize this, although I maybe was saying bias, but the spread across the model spectrum. So, you know, the, the, the bias part might be framed in terms of how the mean over all the models is behaving. Here we're trying to look at deviations from the mean. Of, you know, if, if we didn't see anything, of course we'd always see something because the EOF analysis would pick out something, but uh, it tells us how much the models are spreading relative to one another. So I think that was the, uh, the idea. I wish you would say classical term is factor analysis. Factor analysis. Two, seven, one, eight, six, right? Or each one is a sample. Right. I, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. So, so when you did your singular value decomposition, mm -hmm. you sort of get the the uh, link to the SSD, right. and right. so you, you sort of interpret that that mode sort of looked like the leading your right. end uh, of just the interrelated and model variability, and so you you sort of interpret that as the difference in SSD uh, as you contribute to that. I actually have a couple of questions about that. So, yeah. so uh, what's the sort of magnitude of the SSP difference or typical? So, yeah, so yeah, it's typical to see from those yeah, plots. It is, it is typical. Um, so basically, this, the scale here goes from, uh, well, it's mostly positive. So you're going from white zero to about one and a half degrees. So, so if you kind of, you know, so then you have to, Think about if if you took the difference between the model with the strongest the 
the greatest positive loading and the, the largest negative loading. That's like minus 0.4 and about 0.3, so 0.7 or so. So it's so, the degree. Yeah. yeah. The, the other point is that, but, but you also suggest that in the AMIP runs, you also right. get that type of pattern. So, that, so, so how do we reconcile that? It, it well, sort of suggests that that pattern is sort of in, intermodal. Even if you fix the SST, they still have that right. sort of pattern. You know, so the in the in the AMIP <coughs> case, I mean, I would sort of argue that it's it's more about what's happening over here in the western part, and you see relatively little signal over here. So I, I think the idea could be that. Yeah, the, the SST, bias in the SST is going to affect this, maybe it kind of excites this pattern, but just the, the, the interplay of atmospheric size processes given perfect specification of the sea surface temperature in this region of very intense convection, especially you know, when you think about being coupled as well to what's happening in the, sub, in the summer monsoon over Australia. The, there's enough, you know, red that's introduced in the atmospheric side that you still get this. So I have a question. Okay, stop then. Thanks. Okay, I saw kind of Thank you.